Well, grace and peace to all of you this morning. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful morning. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here in Jesus' name and to learn from your word. Father, I'm thrilled at many of the discussions and conversations and insights that we have collectively come to. I know full well that your Holy Spirit is at work. We ask that he would be present in our gathering today. We ask that he would help all of the speakers, help everyone listening, help everyone listening to contribute, to ask good, dis- good questions, and may everything that we think and say be pleasing to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday, we did our Harvard tour, and we had an opportunity to see with our own eyes some of the landmarks and buildings, and I told you the stories of different individuals who were involved in the founding of Harvard and the historic struggle to keep it true to its mission. But as we saw, by basically by the 1800s, mid-1800s, the battle, the war, was lost. What I'd like to do in this session is talk about drift, mission drift, what that looks like, particularly in the context of the church. But I want to, before we do that, summarize what we talked about in our last session because we're going to build on a lot of that in today's session. So we talked last time about how there is an impulse that many people have, not all, but many people have to change the world. And that's a good impulse. It's a good impulse. It's a God-given impulse to want to be someone who leaves a mark in some way in the world. There's, there's two, I would say, common wrong-headed approaches that are taken. We talked about one last time. I want to mention the other one because it's important to fill out this thought. So I would say that there's a generic idea out there that people have to change the world simply by, I would call it, doing good deeds. Doing good deeds is a good thing. No one would would contest that. But I want to read you a story, true story, written by someone named Peter Greer, who talks about his experience doing microfinance lending in Africa. So all of us would hear that and think that sounds like a very noble goal, a very noble enterprise. So he says this, the first time I encountered the ugly secret was while managing a microfinance program in Rwanda. Jean-Paul was one of the first people I helped to kickstart a small business. Early in our relationship, I visited Jean-Paul. His home stood in a dilapidated state of disrepair. His children didn't attend school. His household was a portrait of poverty. And my job was to invest in people like him. I helped Jean-Paul start a small market selling garments and soap and give him the basic business training and capital he needed to get the business up and running. And Jean-Paul took off. His income surged and his business expanded. After he achieved business success, I visited him again. As I walked the dusty road to his home, I expected to see a renovated house. I anticipated meeting joyful kids, textbook in hand. I quietly hoped to snap my picture with his gleeful children. But there was no change. His kids weren't in school. His home showed no improvements. He was making money, but his home and family still communicated an image of poverty. Later, I learned that Jean Paul used his increased profits on prostitutes and alcohol. His business success and increased income did not improve his life and did not make life better for his family. Having dedicated the last several years of my life to economic development, I experienced incredible disappointment. I moved to Africa to serve the Lord and try to make a lasting impact. But I was simply helping Jean Paul consume more liquor and abuse more women trapped in prostitution. Talk about a sobering realization. It forced me to question everything. And it reinforced Christoph, this is Nicholas Christoph, who's a columnist for the New York Times, ugly secret. I realized he was correct. If we're going to make more progress, we need to look unflinchingly at uncomfortable truths. So I like that story. It's a, it's a great story that encapsulates the disappointment that many people have who try to change the world simply by doing good deeds. 
Nothing wrong with doing good deeds, but as we see in the story of Jean Paul, it actually enabled him to buy more alcohol, sleep with more prostitutes, and this man, Peter Greer, who's a devout Christian, had to question everything. It's interesting, Nicholas Kristof, who's a secular columnist who works for the New York Times, he has, over the last few years, encouraged his readers to rethink their whole idea of what it means to change the world. This is very interesting. I'll read you a quote from an atheist who's a British journalist. He's writing in a paper called the London Times. And he says this. He, sur he has surveyed all the models of change and people who want to do world change and start NGOs and feed the poor and start orphanages. And he says this. As, quote, as an atheist, I truly believe Africa needs God. Now a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa. Sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, government projects, and international aid efforts. These alone will not do. Education and training alone will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people heart, people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real. The change is good. It's an atheist writing, surveying all the work that he's in. He's saying all the secular NGO work, everything that's going on there. It's not changing people's hearts. It's actually contributing to the problem. And he, he goes on, and this quote to me is one of the most poignant quotes summarizing the state of doing good apart from the kingdom, doing good apart from Jesus. Atheist, Matthew Paris, again, he continues, removing Christian evangelism from the African equation may leave the continent at the mercy of a malignant fusion of Nike, the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. What a powerful insight that this atheist writes in a secular newspaper. So we could spend a lot of time just on this mode of thinking about how world change doesn't happen. And my contention is you go to most universities, you go to the Harvards of the world, the Yales of the world, people are being encouraged to go out and start these NGOs and feed the poor and do all those things, none of which we can critique but in the end are incomplete. And without that complete solution, which we're going to talk about momentarily, it can actually do more harm than good. Okay, so the other model of changing the world that we talked about in most of our session is this populist model. This idea that individuals are basically free actors and that we are in this worldview war and if you could go out and win individuals to your cause, then you will eventually take over the culture. So this is a model that we spent time talking about. I read you a lot of quotes from different Christians who were trying to advocate for this model, but in the end, it falls terribly short. It falls terribly short because in reality, it's structures and it's institutions that exert change. And so we made this list of institutions. We set apart the church here, but we looked at the government, we talked about government, University, social media, news media, entertainment, business, family, clubs, public schools. And we talked about how it's very interesting because when you look at the population in America of professing Christians, it's been roughly constant for a long time. And yet most people have observed that there's been a lot of things that have happened, in, particularly in recent decades, that have been quite surprising and antithetical to Christian values. And in fact, when you look at very small populations, the gay community is one example, they have exerted massive influence on society far disproportionate to their numbers. And that's because they generally are much more empowered in, for example, the entertainment industry, controlling the media, controlling a lot of high profile businesses. And a very small number of people are able to leverage their influence to change society because they're embedded in these structures of institutional power. And so the populist model of just sort of winning individuals as one-offs, it's insufficient. It does not explain the way that societies have developed. You have to understand that we are, 99.9% .9 of us, maybe 0.99% of us, are fundamentally uh, the, the ones who are being impacted by all of these different structures and all of these different institutions. And so to go out and say, hey, I'm just going to win an individual here, I'm going to win an individual there, and try to change the world, it's not going to work. In fact, Jesus has given us 
a much better solution, which is an alternative structure, an alternative institution in which we are to be embedding ourselves, which is the church. And the church is supposed to be this rival institution to everything else on here. And that structure, if properly implemented, is a fortress. It is going to be what ultimately is able to bring people out of the kingdom of this world. Now, one of the things that, that at least my reaction is when I look at this list, I think, who can stand? When you think about all of the people out there who are every day being assaulted from all of these different influences from these different institutions, who can possibly withstand all of those influences? Particularly when you think about a verse, it's from 1 John 5, 19. It says, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one? If you do, then you ought to be skeptical that many of these forces are, in fact, from the evil one. Now, you might say, where is this formulated in the Bible? Well, in fact, it's actually all throughout the Bible. Paul, in one place in Ephesians 6, depending on your translation, this is the New King James, it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So principalities, powers, and the rulers of darkness in this age. The ESV calls it rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers over this present darkness. So these, these entities here, these are the authorities, the rulers, the principalities, the powers, the powers over this present darkness. Paul is saying that that's where our struggle is. It's not against an individual. It's not against flesh and blood. But we're in this cosmic battle. So these systems are broken. They are opposed to God. They, they are therefore entities that we need to be very skeptical about. We talked two days ago about how also these institutions, they resist change. So I showed you in our tour we looked at Phillips Brooks' house, and his statue is literally right across the street here. I want everyone to look at it when you go out. It's in, right in front of tr the Trinity Church. So Phillips Brooks, who was a very capable writer, a very capable speaker, a very capable organizer, he did his best to try to seize Harvard back from the Unitarian downward spiral. And in an environment that was far more hospitable to traditional Orthodox Christianity, and he failed. Institutions resist change. It is almost impossible to find examples of where institutions go back. I remind myself of this often when I'm walking around Harvard. We were teaching the Society for the Two Tasks, that apologetics group, for the last year, and a Greek class. And my boys, my younger boys, would come with me from time to time there. And I would tell them, don't be awed by this building. Don't be awed by this campus. Don't be awed by all that you, that you see there because in the last day, not one stone will be left upon another. I also remind everyone that what is highly esteemed among men is what? Detestable. It's an abomination in the sight of God. That's what it says in Luke 16, 15. That is a very powerful insight. The more revered the institution, the more celebrated, the more everyone loves it, the more, according to Jesus, it's an abomination in the sight of God. Having been at Harvard for those eight years, for having attended uh, there and being on the inside, watching students there get ensnared and entrapped by all kinds of false ideology, it's given me a very different perspective. I don't wear Harvard gear. I don't wear their flags. I don't advertise for them. That's how strongly I feel that this, these are broken institutions that are actually completely opposed to God's ways. So that's a summary of what we talked about a couple of days ago regarding the myth of populism, the myth of world change is being affected by individuals. In fact, the vast majority of the power in the world is resident in institutions and structures. And only the Church of King Jesus has the ability to challenge that in any meaningful way. So this is why we see so often people waiting in the New Testament for the kingdom of God, for the church of God, because they recognized that every other structure around them was broken. Every other structure around them was impotent to ultimately combat 
the downward pull of sin and death. So let's talk now in our new session about drift. Drift is an important critique for us to tackle. Many times when people look, particularly at urban churches, they say, oh, it's going to go apostate, it's going to fall away. How can you have any confidence that you're placing your soul in a secure place? Well, the first thing I like to point out in that is we have to be a little bit careful because, as they say, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. It's not obvious to me that there's great models in rural settings that I can look at and say, wow, you all have figured it out. And Therefore, you, you, um, we can have a lot of confidence in your model. So, but that being said, critique is a critique, and we need to be aware, aware of that. It certainly is a common danger. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to engage all of us and ask the question, let's think from the Bible of where there has been examples of drift. Where has there been examples of decline, from the Old Testament or the New Testament? So the golden calf, yeah. So we'll, we'll call it the Exodus generation. So they have seen, let's say, examples of drift. So the Exodus generation and the golden calf are an excellent specimen of this phenomenon. They've Samson? Cr Samson? Yeah, Samson. So can you explain more? where he started out like with the Philistines is, you know, like as he started like where he was before he started with the Philistines and then where he ended up. Yeah. So I'm going to generalize what you said. You're right. Samson is an example. The whole book of Judges is actually an example of this. It's sometimes called the apostasy judge cycle where the Israel does well for a little while, they get complacent, they get ensnared in copying some other nation and then they fall into a very low state, and then that cycle repeats. They cry out for a judge, there's deliverance, and it repeats. So, excellent. So the cycle of the judges. Some more. John? When, when the northern tribes came up, the southern tribes, you see the northern tribes drifting very quickly. Yeah, right. Okay, good. So the northern tribes... That's a, that's a great example. Northern tribes fall away. And they fall away hard into idolatry, into all kinds of pagan practices. Sean, were you going to say something? Yeah, I would say uh, Saul. At the time of Saul would be a good example. He started off as a great king, really. But yeah. Then he was like himself. Yeah, so there, there's certainly many examples of kings who start off well. So it's interesting. With Saul, I think you can see both with his own life, there was quite a change from when he began as this humble Benjaminite to the end of his life. He's consulting the Witch of Endor. There's, there's also, though, another very interesting progression that relates to kings more broadly. So when you look at David to Solomon to Rehoboam, you see this general pattern of drift where David the warrior you know, it's, it's so interesting. You know, he, he's described as, of course, the man who's after God's own heart. And Solomon, who has this incredible wisdom, at the end of his life, he is married to all these women. He's got all of these material goods. And it, it also seems like he's getting ensnared in worshiping other gods, all this idolatry. And for all of David's faults, I can never imagine him worshiping another god and the idolatry, right? So he t t commits idolatry, I mean, commits adultery, has many terrible sins, but he at least has within him this fidelity to the God of Israel that Solomon himself doesn't have. And then you go to Rehoboam, and Rehoboam is a mess. Rehoboam seems to not get anything at all, and the whole kingdom unravels under him. So you have this sort of intergenerational pattern of drift or decline that happens there. Good. What else? Yeah, so you touched on that in your message on Sunday. So Peter, of course, is the one who is given this tremendous vision about the sheet and the animals and is supposed to understand that Jew and Gentile are now 
one community. He goes to Cornelius' house. He sees the Gentiles speaking in tongues. He sees all of these events. And then after that in Galatians, you see him withdraw from table fellowship with the Gentiles. So I'll call that Peter's struggle with ethnocentrism. There are more. Tim. The churches in Revelation. Yeah, excellent. So that was one of the ones I had. So the churches in Revelation. So that is a, a powerful example. So you see there these seven churches, and except for two of them, five of them have drifted. And Jesus actually gives very specific diagnoses as to why they've gone adrift. Good, good example there. Others. Uh, coming to my mind is uh, Judas Iscariot. Judas? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Judas is a kind of a complicated example because he's, he's um, it seems like Jesus knows that he's a deceiver. But yeah, I, I, would, I would take that. Are you talking from a more micro standpoint? I mean, I'm thinking a little bit more about intergenerationally, okay. but micro examples are okay. The flood. The flood? Can you explain? Yeah, yeah, and of course that's, that's those. Bigger, I mean. Yeah, it's bigger, and those aren't necessarily people who had that much revelation. But yeah, I, we can take that. Right, that's true. So we'll put flood slash Noah's family. Others. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Can you elaborate? Okay. Okay. I'll give I'll give a couple more that are more intergenerational. So it it talks about in the early chapters of Judges actually about how in Joshua's day the people the people were serving the Lord, but then after he dies, the next generation doesn't seem to know the Lord and they fall away. There's another example of Eli in the book of 1 Samuel, and he's an okay high priest, but his sons, they don't get it at all. They're sleeping with women out in the temple. They're, they seem to be these meat infatuated people who are taking meat and stealing meat basically from God's, God's provision. And then there's another example, which is actually highlighted in the books of uh, the Kings or Chronicles, which is the whole practice of the law at Passover, all that goes away. And it's only discovered in Josiah's reign. So in fact, the whole Torah goes away for hundreds of years. So I'll call it, I'll call it Torah observance during the time of the Kings. And then there's a, there's a revival, if you remember the story, under Josiah's leadership. Okay, any other intergenerational examples anyone can think of? Samuel would be one. Boys yeah, Samuel, I, was, I thought about that too. Samuel is somewhat similar to Eli there, that he didn't pass down the faith either to the next generation, which is, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll put that right here in parentheses. Okay, so now... We've seen a bunch of examples. So now, in this column over here, we can scan these ones and look at the causes of drift. So you don't have to, we don't have to go in order, but knowing what we know about these, let's try to make a list of what were the causes of drift. Idolatry. I idolatry? Okay. So, Glenn, what were you going to say? Pride, okay, so I'm gonna put pride, and then for idolatry, I'm gonna actually generalize that a little bit more. I'm gonna put down as a cause, copying other nations. Because the idolatry seemed to be one element within this heading.
What else? I think just from a general compromise, uh, I, think, I don't know how you would phrase that when you're talking about an institution, but you know, it's always on a micro level, start calling this compromise and how bad it needs from the perspective. You know, yeah. The receiver is like, hey, do you really say, you know, do you really mean? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll put it actually just like that, general compromise. I like that. General compromise. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to phrase that in a slightly different way. I'm going to call it complaining. So some of you have had the opportunity to listen to my preaching through the book of Numbers, where you see the Exodus generation time and time and time again complain, and because of their complaining, that becomes this gateway to a whole host of other sins that ultimately takes them away from God. So that, that's a big one. So complaining and discontentedness. Losing sight of the vision. Yeah, excellent. So can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Good. The ingratitude is like loss of perspective from what they're rescued from. Yeah. I'm going to call that one forgetting. And you said ingratitude too, but I'll, and I'll put that as a, as a, uh, after the slash here, forgetting slash ingratitude. So it seems like this is a part of the human condition that we generally forget the, the hard-fought battles that our spiritual ancestors have waged. And as a result of that, we become ungrateful. That's a very important one, Steve. Robert. Loss of identity, or at least a grip from identity, where Paul is continually reminding his congregations who they are in Christ. Don't forget <clears throat> who you once were, now know who you are. Right. Him. Okay. Loss of identity. Bill. This is kind of wrapped up in both of those, are, but uh, a loss of their history. Like the history yeah. there says there was a generation that didn't know the God of God, only when he was in the Right. Loss of history. Amen. Wealth, yes. We can't forget wealth. So that was an important cause of the downward trend of, certainly, of Solomon here. And there's other, other examples we can, we can find. Uh, John. Complacency. Complacency, yeah. Which could a couple of Yeah, it could. But that's OK. I want to I wanna restate that one. I'm going to write that. Anyway, because even though it does overlap, it's a very important one. In fact, you could probably make the case that in almost every one of these, there's some element of complacency underneath the, the downward drift. I'm lusting for women or yeah. that drawing them away to other nations because they find their women beautiful. Right. So I'm going to put down lust generally. And it, and it can be for women or sexual pleasure. It can also be for food. It's very interesting to look at the first time the Exodus generation complains. I think it's Numbers 12. They, they lust after the food that they had back in Egypt. They say, ah, we had the cucumbers and the garlic and the melons and the leeks. And very interestingly, Adam and Eve, it was food, again, that was the cause of their downward decline. And in the book of Acts, the church is doing so well, and all of a sudden they have a dispute about food and food provisions between the Hellenic Jews and the Hebraic Jews and all that. So food is actually higher up on the list than we give it credit for. Certainly women played a role in Solomon. It played a role with Eli's sons. Maybe there's some other examples here where kind of sexual lust played a role. Yeah, I would I would tie that in with immorality. There. Okay, I would say leadership failure. Many of these examples. Yes. Of the leader failed at the top. Good. Whether king or 
our profit. Excellent, yeah. Leadership failure is a big mode of failure that is a cause of drift. Excellent, John. Any other ideas there? I think it's a pretty good list. So let's, let's talk about this in a little more organized of a framework. It was, it was good to brainstorm like this. There's, there's a study that has been done by Peter Greer and someone named Horst where they look at a variety of different organizations. It's geared mostly at nonprofits, but also somewhat to the church. And it's fascinating because they, they look over the last couple of hundred years, and the claim they make is that the vast majority of institutions, nonprofits, universities, have drifted from their mission. Only a select number have gone mission true. And they actually highlight Harvard as one of their examples. There. Again, we spent quite a bit of time yesterday on our Christian history tour of Harvard. There's, there's some other pretty notable examples. So one is YMCA. So the YMCA was founded with a very strong call to do Bible study and personal evangelism and discipleship. Well, eventually they decided to, they had hit some hard times and they had decided to kind of regroup and promote family fitness and athletics. And eventually, they got a donor base that was not so interested in the Christian piece of things. And a couple of years ago, I think it was 2011, they actually changed their name from the YMCA to the Y. So the M and C and the A are gone now. So it's now technically the Y. And, uh, and that's a very powerful example of now something where a lot of people I think people who are young now, they don't even know this history. They don't know the YMCA had a completely different purpose. They just think of it as that's where I go to swim. Or that's where I go to do yoga or something like that. Another really very interesting example. So the whole microfinance industry has come into popularity in the last few years. It's good reasons. Uh, Grameen Bank got a, uh, Grameen got a Nobel Prize for that a few years ago. But actually the history of microfinance goes back to the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, there were a variety of these monk-type groups and, and friar-type groups that, as a ministry, they wanted to provide loans to the very poor in order, basically, to have them put food on the table. And that was a, a very noble vision. And interestingly, you can chase that down and see what happened to those institutions. They survived. Those institutions are, are, are alive today. Do you know what they became? The pawn shop. So there's a fascinating historic lineage you can trace down. And directly, that industry of microfinance and serving the poor became something that now is something that, in many ways, people would say is exploiting the poor. And so fascinating connection there to see what can happen over, in this case, several hundred years, where you look at the pawn shop today and you think, how in the world is that possibly the descendant of some kind of Christian microfinance enterprise? Well. There are many, many examples. Yesterday, when I was taking the bus, I, was, I had been reading about this and meditating on it. And I was approached by a young man who came up to me. He was wearing one of those jerseys that indicated he was fundraising. And he was raising for a group called the Child Fund. I don't know how many of you know the Child Fund. But it actually began. And so I talked with him for maybe five, 10 minutes. And I said, I know about your group. And uh, he said, you do? And they said, yeah, let me tell you about some of the history of your group. And I said, did you know that your group actually began as a Christian organization that was geared at feeding uh, at, at the holistic ministry of serving uh, the poor, including with the gospel in China? And eventually, <clears throat> a new donor base came in. And they said, why don't we just drop the term Christian from your name? And today, Child Fund is a completely secular organization. And um, it was very interesting to have this conversation with this young man. He was a very nice, very nice man there. So how do we avoid mission drift? How do we combat that? How do we think about this, particularly from the perspective of the church? I'm going, I'm going to give you five basic headings, some of which we've covered already. But I think these five headings are a good way to get the concept at a 
at a structural level, which are very important. So the first way to avoid drift is to affirm and internalize the original vision. To affirm and internalize the original vision. So it's very interesting. This is a verse that not many people have paid attention to. In Deuteronomy, there's a verse where God actually tells every king to, by hand, they're supposed to write out with their own hand a copy of the law. They're supposed to write out a copy of the Torah. I don't know how many people have paid attention to this verse, but it's a command there that God wants every single king of his people to literally get out, well, back in that day, I suppose it would have been some kind of feather, but get out some kind of writing implement and, and write out uh, the entirety of the law. Actually, a kind of interesting story. I have a friend, a married couple friend, and they actually have their children do that, and they homeschool. And every child, by the time they graduate, is expected to have written out the entire Bible with their own hand and uh, to present that as effectively uh, one of their great accomplishments of life. You can do it if you spread it out over a, enough period of time. Actually, the record is I think somebody did it. They were maybe a crammer. They didn't spread it out as they were supposed to. And they copied out the whole Bible in one month. Um, you can do that um, by hand. So that's a, maybe an exercise to consider for those of you who are wanting to do it for yourself or raising children. So why does God want kings to do that? Why does he want kings to be able to go through this exercise of writing out the whole law? Well, he obviously wants them to internalize in their own brains the... Uh, the tenets of the law, to have that be something that is not something that they've merely picked up by hearsay. I don't off the top of my head. I can look it up. Oh, Dan knows? 17. 17? That sounds right. Deuteronomy 17. Yeah, maybe if somebody wants to flip to it, they can call it out. So affirming and internalizing the vision. It is so easy to do that. So when you look at these nonprofits especially, so many of them, they started off, say, as a Christian group that would do relief and development. And very often you will find that people who are workers or volunteers there, what they'll do is when they're in one group of, of people, say whether they're in the church, they'll emphasize the Christian part. They'll say we're a Christian group. When they're talking to somebody else, they still say we feed the poor, we do relief. And they notice that they are not being on message. And one, to one group, they'll highlight the Christian part. To another group, they'll completely drop that all together. And there's a dissonance there that often occurs. And the strongest organizations, the strongest churches that have stayed on message, they don't change their message depending on, who, on whom they're speaking to. They are very faithful in relating what their, their vision is. They say it boldly. They articulate their distinctives. And they're not ashamed of their distinctives. You know, it's so tempting, isn't it, in our culture, in our world, to if you have something that puts you at odds, something that makes you starkly different from the world around you, to not talk about that. We all want to blend in. And to, to faithfully and regularly articulate your distinctives is something that few people want to do. One of the things that, that I am struck by in Jesus' teachings is he, he says, if you are ashamed of me and my words, I'm going to be ashamed of you when I come in my glory with the holy angels. Are we ashamed? We have to be fighting this battle. We have to be willing to say it, the distinctives, the hard sayings of Jesus, the hard sayings of the New Testament regularly. We have to understand it, own it, be able to say what it is, where it is in the Bible, and why we do it. I remember when Laura, my wife, and I were on our journey really early on, as almost everyone does, we struggle with the head covering. We were from groups where nobody did it, and you are ridiculed for doing it in most of our settings, or at least people are ashamed. And we went to a particular Mennonite church, and we were talking about it there, and this was very early on our journey, and my wife was talking to a middle-aged lady, she's probably in her 40s, and she said, um, Laura was real excited about this and discovering it, and the lady talked to her and she says, oh yeah, the head covering, that's in Deuteronomy, right? And um, and I think Laura's mouth just dropped open because this was a lady who had been doing this for her whole life. She was culturally uh, a Mennonite. 
She didn't know where in the Bible it was, and her guess was that it was in Deuteronomy. And for us, we were just struggling and wrestling and reading the passage like 10 times and going over it, reading commentary, looking at every angle. And here we are talking to somebody who's been doing it, part of a church where everyone does it, doesn't even know where it is in the Bible. And we're thinking, what in the world? How is it possible that this distinctive, this particular person didn't even know where it was and why exactly uh, this person did it? It's been amazing to me to have conversations after our just war debate. We've had a lot of good conversations there and how so many people who are raised in some kind of Anabaptist setting, they don't really own or know non-resistance. They don't know it deeply in their soul. They can't articulate it well, certainly to those who are antagonistic to it. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong when something that ought to be so deep in your soul, you can't even affirm and articulate and you haven't in internalized. So. This first step is a very foundational step. We, we touched on it here. We can't lose sight of the vision. We have to do it again and again. And this is why, again, all throughout the Bible, why does God tell the, the Israelites, when you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed, you talk about it. You talk about it when you're going in the door. You talk about when you're leaving. You talk about when you're walking on the path. We have to be immersed in the vision. Okay, the next heading is we have to measure ourselves in accordance with the vision that has been laid out. This is a, a very widely appreciated teaching or, or principle in the business world where if you don't measure it, it doesn't matter. That's a, a very well accepted principle in business. If something is important to you, you got to put some kind of metric on it so that your, your people, your culture, your employees, they know this is, this is who we are and there's going to be some kind of accountability around that. And so how do we measure ourselves in relation to the vision? Jesus himself said something very similar when he says, you'll know them by their fruits. We're supposed to be fruit inspectors. We're supposed to be looking at our, ourselves, our groups, and evalu evaluating ourselves very carefully according to the, the vision and according to scripture. So this is very important because so often, I think all of us know, our tendency is to give lip service to something, not measure ourselves according to whatever that particular metric might be and therefore drift from it. So this is also why I, I have found to be incredible value in reading and understanding church history. So when you try to measure yourself, sometimes what can happen is you can become deceived because you can be comparing yourselves to yourselves, right? And you can look around and say, hey, we're doing pretty well. Um, we all kind of look the same and we're doing okay and that's great. I read an essay when I was in college that there was an insight that came from this essay that I've never forgotten. He talks about how most people fall into this incestuous trap where everyone's kind of reading the same books, everyone is comparing the same notes, they're all listening to the same speakers, and everyone basically is judging one another based on a fairly limited perspective. And so in this particular essay, the author may, makes the case that the only way to break that, or at least a effective way to break that, is to read outside of your generation. Because he says, you're going to have blind spots because you're all doing the same thing. And another generation will have blind spots too, but they're going to be different from your blind spots. And so at least when you look at another generation, you can say, wow, look at how they did this. Or look at how they did that. And we're not doing that. Why are we not doing that? Why, why that difference? And it is striking to me that the groups that have fared the best are typically those that you have a very deep appreciation in the congregation of history. So that was, again, one of the things that was mentioned before in our list. How is our lukewarmness? How is our general state of obedience? How is our faithfulness? And what is our standard? Our standard is obedience to the commands of the New Testament. How are we measuring ourselves there? What is our level of of thought that we put into that. Do you, do you think about this? Do you think about this when you look at your group? Are you, are you measuring yourselves carefully? 
a related but third heading here is accountability. So there's measurement and there's accountability. So accountability is different from measurement. So you can measure something, but then not do anything about it, right? You can say, oh, we're going astray, but then you have no mechanism to have someone kick you from behind and say, hey, let's get it right here. So this is, this is very important to have an, kind of an, an important level of externalization of accountability. One of the things that I do in, in my life is anything that's really important, I try to set it up as a set of meetings so that I have to show up because if I don't, if, uh, because I know there's someone else is going to be there waiting for me and if I'm not there, the meeting's not going to happen. And so you can actually accomplish a tremendous amount in your life simply by saying these are the things that are the most important to me, so therefore I'm going to externalize them and set up accountability patterns around those things so that I won't fall away. I do this at work very, uh, very deeply because I recognize if I don't have accountability structures in place, we will drift. So what are the kinds of accountability that we ought to have? So the first thing is internal to the group, there ought to be some kind of accountability forum. So in our group, it follows the way, once a month after our, uh, on, a, on a Thursday morning, we will have a men's accountability breakfast. And I take notes and I write down, if someone says they've struggled with whatever it is, I will ask them the next session, how have you done with X? And those of you who come know that I bring my notes, I, I ask people about them and I carry them forward. I don't want people slipping through the cracks. It is fascinating to look at how many people have fallen in their lives because of a lack of accountability. I was just reading actually a study that was done of, I think it was 270 people who fell into some kind of sexual immorality. And these authors narrated their investigation into these people and what were the failure modes there. And I think they said all, every single person did not have, or maybe there was one person did not have some kind of regular accountability structure that was set up there. So do we have that? Do we have a deep culture of accountability where somebody can look at you in the eye and say, I am concerned about you because of X or Y? When I was in graduate school, I had some similar. We had set up an accountability group where we were going to hold one another accountable for whatever sins we struggled with, as well as scripture memory. And so scripture memory is something that is a fantastic thing where if you're a busy person like most of us, scripture memory is exactly the kind of thing that tends to fall away. People just tend to not do it because they're busy. And what we do in our family is we have our family devotions. And I would say at least half of our nights, we just do Bible memory. And we have our children recite verses. I recite verses. We're all reciting verses just to keep ourselves uh, accountable there. And nobody can run. No one can hide uh, from that. There's another type of accountability, which is external accountability, where you invite people outside of your group to come and speak to your group and to say, hey, what are you doing about this? What are you doing about that? And I think there's a lot of value in having a circulation of people from the outside, ideally from outside even of your denomination or conference or whatever it is, who can, who can come to you and say, what about this? What about that? Are you inviting that? Are you welcoming that? I have found another form of accountability. This is maybe something that you haven't thought about before, but I believe there's a lot of uh, a value in going abroad to the developing world somewhere on some kind of regular basis and comparing yourself to the global church, especially the global poor church. I derived tremendous value from this. When I was young, we would go to India a lot back and forth. There's nothing like being shoulder to shoulder with people that live in a very different culture, have much less than you do, and it challenges you. You think, should I be doing this? Should I be living this way? Should I have this? Should I have that? There is a, a great value in that, and it humbled me. It humbled me in very profound ways that I am extremely grateful for. Accountability regarding pride is another one. You know, more movements have been hung on the gallows of their pride than we can think about. And it's interesting, the more successful you are, the more a movement thrives, the more susceptible you are to fall to, to pride. And how do you check that? How do you, how do you not fall prey to the very thing that we're the most blinded to? How do we do that? It's not a rhetorical question. How do we, 
How do we avoid being ensnared by our own pride? I can think of a couple of movements that I've been in and around over the last couple years of my life that did really well for a while, and then boom, there was just some ugliness that came out. And you look back at it and you think like, wow, we just got really prideful. So how do we, how do we have accountability around our pride? Steve. Um, we were at the uh, um, AXE in March, and uh, this new book had come out about uh, teachings in the book of Revelation. And I was talking to an older gentleman, and I said, What do you think of this? It was a fairly good book. Mm-hmm. A learner's heart, they yeah. They have uh, sacred cows. You know, if there's things that work, that's fantastic. You know, uh, I think a lot of times we can really galvanize something into our own mental institutions mm-hmm. uh, that should not be there. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of the seedbed of pride we hang our hats on the success that we have. Yeah, um, yeah, amen. Tim. Confession of sin, yeah, that, that's a, a big one. And one of the things that I would encourage everyone to do is to try to foster a culture where there is confession of sin. One of the things that we have tried to do is, in our Lord's Supper, we have tried to make that a time where you can feel free to confess sin. We have our accountability breakfast, but on a weekly basis, there ought to be a great forum where we can look at each other in the eye and someone who's sharing, I had a difficult week, I... I failed in this area, that ought not to be something where we are, you know, we gasp in horror and kick the person out, but we say, amen, that is, that's a good thing, and we're supposed to confess our sins one to another in order that we may be healed, so that's a good one. What else? Elizabeth. Right. Right. Yeah. Good. Interaction with different groups. I like that. Plurality of, of leadership on whatever level that, that can be, even if it's not necessarily a, you know maybe the leaders of a movement or a particular group that you know, may not necessarily call. Them yeah. Members. We're going to come to that in, in our next section, but yeah, I, that's a, that's a great great thought there. What else? Pride. Yeah, so that's, that's a good thing to do, to review case studies both positively and negatively. There's, there's nothing like some kind of specimen that you can look at in a few different ways and say, how did this person go wrong? How did this person go right? I, I have become convinced that one of the most powerful ways to understand a person's pride is seeing how they respond to correction. So we've had several opportunities in our years where different individuals have come in and we will offer a correction. A person who is humble, they welcome it. They love it. They receive it. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister, for saying that. Prideful people, they hate it. They kick against that. And they just they tend to run for the exits. The, having a culture where we are free to speak to one another and say, I'm concerned about you brother for this, or I'm concerned about you sister here. And to use that as a way of elucidating where people's hearts are with respect to their pride or their humility is very powerful. Anything else? I feel like sometimes it's hard to find the balance where you go and say, hey brother, I see a need in your life, and at the same time being open to what other people have to say into my life. Because I find like, usually it's one where the other people are open to receive whatever anybody else has for them, and then, but they're not willing Vice versa, yeah. And I think that's just saying it right. There, there ought to be a two-way street going on there, and we ought to be inviting that. I, I tell people often, you know, one of my major life tasks right now is raising children, and I desperately want input. Because, you know, the thing about raising children is that 
you, you see so often, you'll see a family that has one strength, but then they have a weakness. They've got another family has one strength, and another weakness. And everyone is doing some things right and some things wrong. And there are these very subtle differences that produce that. And I try as often as I can to tell people, especially those who are parents who've got children and maybe even a little further ahead, to say, please tell me. I need to know. And, um, and then at the same time, I hope that we can do the same to others when we see a child. We've talked about this several times at Followers of the Way, that if you see a child who is misbehaving in whatever way, don't bottle it up. Don't keep it to yourself because that is a precious insight that to refuse sharing that with whoever the person is is, is a great evil, I would e even say. And, uh, and so you can imagine that same structure put on everything else, on how we speak. Uh, this morning, I had a conversation with someone, and I challenged the person. I said, I, I believe that in a loving way, I believe that you were taking the name of the Lord in vain. And um, I said it in a nice way, in a questioning way, and he agreed. And I feel like it's very important that we do that. And so actually, one, one, uh, one line that I heard, I read in a book once, that it really stuck with me. It said basically something like the one measurement of the success of your life is how many difficult conversations that you've had. And if you, you know, we tend to run from difficult conversations. We tend to like shy away from them. But I think that there's some wisdom in that, that we're going to see lots of things in different people and settings. And it is incumbent upon us to have those difficult conversations. It's hard, but it requires cold courage. But that is a, it's a very useful principle. And in fact, I was saying that to myself this morning because I didn't want to have the conversation. But I reminded myself this morning when I talked to this brother, I said, my mind, this is one of the measures of the success of my life is how many times I've had a difficult conversation with a person. Any other thoughts on pride? Yeah, Tim. Yeah, that, that's very good. Worship is, is absolutely designed to help restore that proper hierarchy that ought to exist where God is our sovereign and we are the created one. Charles and I were talking about this a few days ago. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2 that we are, the, it's talking to men, that men are supposed to pray lifting up holy hands. And and then it says right after that, the women aren't supposed to wear gold, pearls, and expensive clothes. And it's very easy to focus on the latter one. But to the degree that you believe that women shouldn't have gold, pearls, and expensive clothes, which I'm take, taking for granted that you do, you also ought to believe that the men ought to be praying, lifting up holy hands. That, there's something humbling about that. There's something about that where we just want to kind of be like, oh, I'm, I'm cool, or I'm this, I'm that. I don't want to do that. And I would encourage you as an individual and as a church culture to pray, lifting up holy hands. That is something that is, I believe, a God-given mechanism to help us be reminded that we, when we lift up our hands, it's, it's really actually a position of surrender. When, when people would approach a king, particularly in the ancient world, to, to go before the king with open hands, with outstretched hands in this way, it's a sign of you're the superior, I'm the inferior. So that's, that's very much embedded in this idea. What else? I Peter? Yeah. Yes, that's similar to what I was sharing about the global poor. So identifying with the least of these, my brothers, is so important. To, to be a humble person means that you walk with humble people. And we, we ought to be those who can seamlessly, with joy, with, with gladness, be with the least of these. I was, I'm a person who works, works among people who are very successful business people. And they don't feel like my people. I don't actually have to say that generally I'm more disgusted by their lives than attracted to it. But as a way to safeguard myself from all of the traps and the wealth and the snares, I would much rather be spending my, my free time, my, my available time, with the global poor, with those who are the least of, of these. That's a, that's a great point. Let's go on. There's, there's two other headings that I'd like to cover. So our first one was to affirm and internalize the vision. The second was to measure ourselves. And the third was to have accountability. There's two more. The, the 
fourth point is to implement the right structure of the group, implement the right structure. And some of you have been here for the talks that I've done at Followers of the Way over the last few weeks where we've talked about the structure of a group. And I, we're not going to spend too much time on this. It's taken, it takes a number of hours to really develop this, this out. But we there have talked about the, the structure that God gives on his church, which is this acronym, APEST, Apostles, Prophets, Evangelists, shepherds and teachers that's found in Ephesians 4.11. And trying to condense a tremendous amount into a few minutes would not do justice to it. But we really need the diversity of persons to have a functioning, healthy church. So, many, so often what you see is a church will gravitate towards a singular type of leadership, a singular type of person. And... Uh, and the group becomes very distorted. So I have seen groups that are very centered around evangelism. And they've all about evangelism. Actually, I've seen two movements that are very much centered around evangelism. And what happens there is you lack then some of the complementary persons that are designed to instill depth and teaching and discipleship. And so evangelism is great, but only when it's done in proportionality with the other ones. Another very common trap, and this is so important, this is actually God's mechanism, personal mechanism, to ensure that we don't drift, which is to celebrate the prophet. Now, the prophet is inherently a destabilizing person. Right? The prophet is a person who comes in and says, what are, you, what are you people doing? You should be doing this, and you're doing that. What about this over here? And whenever an institution gets a sense of status quo, whenever there's something established, whenever there's something that tends to go well, well, you want to defend that. You want to, be, you want to be preserving of the way of things as they are. And it's the person who has that prophetic-like impulse that comes in that you most want to kick out. And so time and time and time again, when you see a group, particularly the established, when a prophetic-type person comes in, they're exactly the person that gets kicked out of the group because they're the most destabilizing to the structure of the group, and the group wants to preserve itself as it is. And so to have a culture where we look at others and say, I value this person or that person because I can see in them that they have a prophetic insight. Remember, most of the time in the Bible, prophecy is not about predicting the future. Most of the time, it's about seeing the world, seeing the church the way that God sees it, and speaking to the situation in a way that challenges the status quo. And so to have the apest gifts in order, in their proper structure, celebrating all of them, and especially not kicking out the prophets, is vital to avoid drift. I'm convinced that many churches over the generations have kicked out the very people that God sent to their midst to help bring them back to their original vision. Another idea on structure, there's a principle from architecture where it's said both ways sometimes, but you'll hear in architecture this phrase, form determines function. Sometimes you'll hear function determines form. And there's this whole debate about does, does the building, you know, when you make a building, is that going to determine how people act in it or should you do it the other way around? And we won't go into that. But there's, there's no doubt a tremendous interdependency of form and function. I could spend a whole hour talking about just this principle. It's something that I'm very passionate about. Most people arrange their churches in ways that are not according to the New Testament paradigm. And I'll give you an example about this because it's striking when I've shared this with several of you. So some of you who know this will uh, have heard this already. So in India, where I've spent a lot of time, they have been influenced mostly by Western missionaries, by people from America. And there in India, they have this fascinating background where they have something called the caste system, which everyone is born into. So it's 80% of the people in India are Hindu by background. And so you're born into a particular caste. And that caste that you are born into, it determines whom you can marry, what job you have, whom you can eat with. It's a very powerful force that affects much of the culture there. It's funny, when you go to India, you can flip to the back of the newspapers and they will have a matrimonial section in the back of the newspapers, because in India it's mostly arranged marriages. And it will 
the matrimonial section is arranged by caste. So we'll have this caste, this person seeking that person, and we'll describe I'm a 27-year-old engineer seeking a, and then you'll go to the next section of caste. Okay, I'm a 32-year-old woman seeking a, you know, and you think, wow, this is amazing that you would have that so public. Anyway, so it, when, um, when I was in India a few trips ago, I was speaking with my dad about this, who's, who's a native Indian, who's been born and raised there, and I saw this firsthand, where you have people who are converted into Christianity from one particular caste, and they will sit in their meetings, and they will pass around this little thing of crackers and this little, these little thimbles of juice, and they'll do that no problem. But then, when they go home, or outside of the church meeting, they refuse to eat with each other across caste lines. And I see this and I think, this is terrible. How is this possible that you have people who all call themselves Christians, but because they have this residue of the caste mentality in their lives, they're refusing to eat with one another. That's exactly what the Lord's Supper in the first century was designed to destroy, right? Jews and Gentiles, everyone coming together, having real table fellowship. But what happened? Sometime in the third or fourth century, the idea of the Lord's Supper being a full meal, a real meal, got replaced by these tiny little things of bread and juice. And people will kind of like do that because it's not a real meal. So we changed the form of the Lord's Supper and it has influenced very dramatically the function of the Lord's Supper. Uh, that's one powerful example that I will share to you. There are many others. If you have a, a group that meets in a large building and there's several hundred people and there's a worship band on top with a fancy guitar, it's going to lead to a different type of discipleship, a different type of person than if you're meeting in a smaller setting where everyone knows one another, they can look at one another in the eye. We have to think about these issues. We can't assume that the form of our meeting is not going to influence who we are as believers. So this idea of structure is so important. The APES gifts, this idea of form following function, the culture of who we are. Where are we with praying? Where are we with fasting? Where are we with foot washing? Where are we with the Lord's Supper? You know, that's, that's such a powerful set of questions to ask ourselves. We, we need to be asking ourselves, are we a group that fasts? Are we a group that prays a lot? We recently did an all-night prayer meeting uh, in, in our group because I was thinking, wow, we haven't, we haven't done that in our group. And we need to do those regularly. We need to do just like Jesus did and just like the Psalms teach us, pray all night. That's something that is a clear biblical pattern there. What is the culture of our group? What is the structure of our group? Every, every place, every entity has a feel or a structure to it, right? You can't, you can't go to any church and not be there for a few weeks and not feel that culture. What is the structure that is there? Is it a praying church? Is it a place where these types of values are implemented? Okay, and the last heading we'll do, and then I'll have 10 minutes for questions, is we need to remember that we have to fight to not drift. This is an active principle. So the easy way to explain this kind of the classic analogy is using physics, right? So there's this law of thermodynamics that says that entropy increases, that disorder increases, that if you don't actively strive for order, for maintaining fidelity to a vision, you're, you're going to drift. That's just the way it is. That's the way it is in all groups and of all kinds, whether they be religious or not. You have to have some kind of, of decided purpose, of kind of, some kind of decided of structure or plan of energy to not deviate from the vision of the group. And we, we talked about this in some of the examples that were given where it is very easy to be complacent. And I like that word a lot. We have to strive to not be complacent people. We have to be staking out new ground. One of the challenges that I like to give, particularly to churches, is around, along these lines. So I spent, in, I think it was in May, I was speaking at various churches in the Pennsylvania and Ohio area. And I can't, I don't think I can count how many people came to me, ministers who came to me and said, would you come and share in my group because I feel like our group has gone complacent. It's very, very common that this type of, of uh, invitation, at least that I got. And well, then I start having some questions. Where are you? What's going on in the group? And almost always, 
not always, but almost always, there is a very common story behind it, which is that the group is a relatively stable group that's been in one place for a very long time. People have these businesses that have been passed down from generation to generation. Life is basically pretty easy. People don't feel like sojourners and aliens. They don't, they're not really striving. They're not pressing forward, taking out new ground. They're not in the, in the battle. If there's complacency, it's going to happen that, that there is drift. And this is a very, very, very common situation that we are in today in our world. Are we striving? Are we fighting? If somebody were to, to call you out and say, have you been a person who has been a warrior? You've been straining. You've been stretching. You've been pulled. You've been challenged in your individual walk. Has your church been doing that? Right? Ask that, that question. We have to fight as a group to not become enslaved to, to the lust, lust of food, lust to women. You know, are we, are we a gluttonous people? I, I stress that a lot because gluttony is something that can creep in very easily. Are we striving? Are we subjecting ourselves to the kind of self-discipline that the scriptures call us to do? Relating to this, where is the ultimate battle with our fight? You know, one of the things that I love about Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is that when he sees all the things that are going on, he prioritizes the inward life. Everything begins in your prayer closet. It's very easy to, to see something that's adrift and say, oh, the solution must be a standard. It must be some external thing. We're going to try to come up with some rule that is going to change the group. Well, in the end, if there is not an inward fight, if there's not an inward struggle, if there's not an inward agony there, it's not going to flow out. Jesus prioritized the inward life, therefore we need to prioritize the inward life. I've made this challenge often that if you are going to have standards about whatever the external thing is, do you have a corresponding set of inward standards about your prayer life, about your devotional life? Or are you communicating to the group with your standards that what matters fundamentally is only the externals? If you believe in the vision of the Sermon on the Mount, that what matters is the inward that flows to the outward. I believe that the outward is important as well, but it has to start in the interior of our being. So this type of fight, this type of struggle, has to be something that, that begins in our hearts. So those are our five heading items to avoid drift, affirming and internalizing the vision, measuring ourselves according to the vision, according to the scriptures, having accountability, having the right structure, the right culture of the group, and then actively fighting, actively realizing that if we don't, we will drift. That is the iron law of group dynamics. So we've got about seven minutes here for questions. I would love to take any that anyone might have. Well, Glenn. Right. Yeah, it's a great question. So we talked about this. Okay, so let me repeat the question. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Uh, so the question is, is in the book of Revelation, it talks about how if a person, Jesus goes to a church and he says, repent in this way and that way. And if you don't, I'm going to remove your lampstand. That's a very important principle. And I don't think we think about it enough. There is, with all institutions, a point of no return. There is something that I would call a point of no return, which I think is the same thing as your lampstand be, being removed, where a group goes from actually being a church of Jesus Christ to being either a synagogue of Satan or some kind of social club or something else. And that line of demarcation from when a group becomes a true church of the Lord to something that's a social club or a feel-good club or a synagogue of Satan, whatever it is, that point is where the lampstand is removed. And it's scary because that is language that we, I don't think, process enough. We talked yesterday, two days ago about how in God's economy, when a group goes bad, the way that it is restored is a new group gets started. People come off, they, they break off, and they start something afresh. And we talked about why... I think that's why that is the case in, in God's economy. And so once this lampstand has been removed, I, I generally believe that there's not 
hope for that group as an institution. Now, individuals within there, I, I believe, can have hope, but then at that point, it has basically become a dead, a dead uh, organization. It's a dead man walking, if you will. Other well, questions? Yeah. So obviously as a as an institution of church can make a greater impact than the individual. Correct. Um, however the individuals make up the church, right? Right. And so it still takes individuals to form them. Right. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. So to repeat the question, how do we think about this difference between individuals and institutions? Institutions are comprised of individuals. When you're talking about drifting, we're talking about an institution drifting, and how does that relate to individuals? So there, there's something that happens, and it's, it's something that it's, it's hard to, to really uh, wrap your mind around, but it's, it's one of the most palpable feelings that you have. So maybe to use the example from the airline industry. So I've flown a lot. When I fly on Southwest Airlines, Southwest Airlines has a very different culture, a very different feel than when you fly United, for example. There's something that they've done. There's something that they've put into the air, if you will, where you take, it's ordinary individual. They have the same IQ. They're all American. You know, there's not something, but there's something about when people are housed in that structure of Southwest Airlines that changes the customer service, it changes the way you feel, it changes the whole dynamic. And what is that? Like, what is that thing? Like Southwest Airlines, what is it? Is it, it's not a person, it's a company, but what is a company? There's something that happens where organizations, they become, in many ways, a living being that has properties just like all of us. And, and that living being has this ability to influence us and control us and change our experience in ways that that we all know intuitively, right? I mean, when you walk into grocery stores or airlines, I mean, we, we experience this all the time. Churches, they all have that. And so there comes this point where individuals come together and something is birthed out of that that is a church. And, and this is why it's so important to recognize the church as a distinct entity that is not merely the individuals in it. There's something bigger than the sum of its parts that's created, just like happens in an organization. And and so when we're talking about influence here, we have to recognize that, yes, individuals can impact that, but we're also influenced by it. And so with all of these discussions, there is a point at which you can influence the group, you can influence that, and there comes a point where you can't. And this is getting to what Glenn was also asking about, about when the land stand has been removed and when, when is a group healthy enough to be able to adapt and course correct and do all those things. And that's really where that APEST idea is so important as well. Do we have embedded in our culture, in our structure, the ability to course correct? It's so interesting, you know, a lot of people, when they read 1 Corinthians 14, it talks about these prophets standing up in the meeting and sharing and one have to, and most people, they read that and think, what in the world is this about? Like, I don't even know what this is talking about. Uh, you see this in the DDK, it talks about, which is one of the earliest church documents written, it talks about how to receive welcome prophets who are walking around. And you think, like, what does this mean? Like, I don't even know how to process that. Well, it's because we've devalued that culture of the very people who are designed to bring that course correction and that change. And it's because we don't know who they are. What a surprise that we have a lot of the problems that we do today about mission drift. So there's a, there's a complex interplay between the individuals and the institution. We just have to remember that the institution is very much its own entity, its own power and principality, <laughs> to use the language of Paul there. Maybe one last question if there is one. Okay. 